So recently, the American Idol star David Archuleta came out as gay and left the church. Now, let me be the first one to recognize the very real challenge that it is for a Latter-day Saint to experience same-sex attraction. I have deep sympathy for those who struggle in this area to reconcile these attractions with their faith. But David is going beyond simply leaving the church. He seems very much intent on publicly mocking the church. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I'm experiencing things as an adult that most people experienced in junior high and high school. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I'm a lightweight when it comes to drinking alcohol. <laughs> I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course one cup of coffee makes my body freak out and gives me the jitters. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I was a 30-year-old virgin. Was. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course it feels freeing to be able to wear tank tops again. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I felt naked not wearing garments for the first six months of not wearing them. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I'm catching up on all the swear words like Oh, and I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I hid while I went to the Book of Mormon musical because I was afraid of anyone seeing me cease watch something that was inappropriate. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I'm going to write a song about how hard it is to walk away from your faith when you believed all your life that it was the absolute truth. That was the deciding factor of every decision you made. And it's called Hell Together. And it's coming out March 20th, by the way. Oh, we're gonna have together. Recently, he decided to use his leaving of the church as a chance to get his music career going again by creating and promoting a new song called Hell Together, which celebrates his mother's decision to leave the church and her telling him that she would rather be in hell together with him than to be part of a church that doesn't make him feel welcome. Needless to say, even many members, like the well-known violinist Lindsey Sterling, are praising the move of his mother to abandon her covenants as an act of heroic motherly love. But the reality is that David and his mother and those cheering them on simply do not understand our doctrine on multiple levels. Jesus Christ addressed this issue directly in one of his most shocking sayings. He that loveth his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Yikes. Why would he say something like this? Does Christ really expect us to choose him and his gospel, even if that means sacrificing not only our own sexuality, but even our own family? Well, yeah. But why? Well, to start, maybe ask yourself this question. Should God be considered more important than our own family? Should our family occupy the center place and foundation of our life? In LDS theology, the family is the number two priority, right after God. To love God is our first priority. Our second is to love our fellow man, starting with those closest to us. I love my wife and children more than anything in the world, and it is because of that love that I love God first, because it is that love of God that actually enables our relationship to each other in their highest potential. You see, if something transcendent does not act as your foundation for your life, then you are building on sand. If your family occupies the place of God, what happens when they die in a car crash? What happens when your spouse betrays you? Again, our family should occupy the number two spot, meaning they are the most important thing in this world. But it does not take very long to realize that they cannot and should not occupy the center of everything. They can't occupy the place that God must occupy. Now, why is this? It's because reality itself is such that if you value your family over the truth, your family relationships cannot reach their full potential. And what is funny is that we all know this. 
Relationships must be built on truth. Again, the center place of our life must be in something transcendent. Indeed, it is because of your love of the truth that Christ embodies that your family is blessed. Don't forget the great Christian paradox that Christ gave earlier. It is by losing our life that we find it. It is in the placing of something above the value of our own life that we find our life. Now, think about the story of Abraham. Abraham's story with Isaac is absolutely disturbing until you realize what it is actually trying to communicate. Why is Abraham able to keep his son? It's because he is willing to value God, the embodiment of truth, even more than his son. That is why he is ultimately able to keep his son. The great paradox is that by putting God first, our families are able to reach their full potential. And this is where our unique LDS theology expounds as to why this is. In our theology, God and all of us are subject to reality itself, something we call eternal law. And thus, God does not place you in some eternal concentration camp according to his arbitrary whim. Ultimately, we go where we want to go. And God is calling us to join him in the ultimate state of togetherness in a place we call the celestial kingdom. The celestial kingdom is the place where people choose to go who want to live in the highest degree of oneness with God and each other by harmonizing our relationships into a celestial order. The laws and ordinances of the gospel are like the music we are all called to play together to harmonize ourselves and our relationships so as to make manifest the deepest forms of the good, true, and beautiful. Hell is not even a place in the restored gospel. It is a state we find ourselves in when we are out of harmony with this celestial order and thus are holding back our relationships with each other from reaching their full potential, like the potential for men and women to join our Heavenly Father and Mother in an eternal life of divine parentage. God does not just want us to have enjoyable relationships with one another. He wants our relationships to transform into the deepest connections possible. The oneness described by Jesus in John 17. The oneness shared by the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The very notion of hell together is an oxymoron. It's like talking about a square circle. The reality is our friend David has set up a false dichotomy between faith in God and relationships between family members. It's simply not true. Indeed, it is because of my faith in God that I seek to maximize my relationships with all of my brothers and sisters, especially those who stray. But the reality is such that those relationships can only go so far without God. We simply cannot have oneness without a unifying principle. You cannot have oneness without the one. So to all those thinking they have to choose between their faith in the restored gospel and their children or family members, please know that you don't have to. Your children or others may be holding your faith hostage, but it's simply because they don't understand it. Choose God, not in spite of your love for your children, but because of that love. Because He is the way that our love and relationships can be eternal. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, 
where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.